you, but in, in general what happens is when there's a brain trauma, just as when you hurt your ankle, you guard it. You, you try not to, to use it so that you don't do more harm. But more often than not, that guarding causes difficulties. And another of the, one of the people I visited was Dr. Edward Taub. And what he was able to, sh to show was that after we have a stroke, um, the brain goes into this kind of shock and you try to use your affected arm and it just won't work. So you learn it won't work and you start to use your better arm. And one of the core plastic principles we've learned is that it's a use it or lose it brain and plasticity is competitive. There's a constant war of nerves going on inside each of your heads uh, till the day you die for cortical real estate. And so the things that you do create coalitions of neurons that are very, very effective and work well together and they're faster than the other coalitions of neurons. And they kind of bully out the other possibilities. So what Taub did with Michael Bernstein, a surgeon who in his 50s had a stroke, um, was he took his good arm and he put it into uh, a sling so he couldn't use it and then incrementally trained that. And that model works for many, many kinds of neuroplastic interventions. But what I want to emphasize to you is the competitive nature of plasticity. And this brings me to really the, the fourth reason that we missed um, the existence of brain plasticity. And that's plasticity itself. Plasticity is the culprit that causes us to miss plasticity. Because plasticity gives rise both to many of our um, flexible, but also our most rigid behaviors. And I don't like to use metaphors in general about this, because I saw how the machine metaphor caused a lot of difficulty. But one way to think about it is that plasticity is like snow on a hill in winter. And because that snow is plastic or pliable, you can take many paths down that hill. That's the flexibility. Not an infinite number of paths because there's going to be rocks and trees in different places. And so they're going to constrain you somewhat. But if you go down that path and you like it, being human, you'll tend to favor a path very close to it or closer to it than any other path the second and third and fourth time down. And as you do that, you're likely to develop tracks in the snow. And those tracks will soon become ruts. And they'll become ruts, and you'll, you'll get tracks precisely because the plasticity is, makes for a snow that's pliable and fl flexible. And I believe that one of the things that we've all done is we have extrapolated, we've looked at our own rigid behaviors in life and the rigid behaviors of, of our peers and extrapolated many of these back onto the human brain. And we've done it not just as individuals, We've also done it as a species because plasticity has this dual nature. So that's one of the most important things I learned in all my studies, the, what I call the plastic paradox. Um, but I also learned that the brain, the resilient brain, is also a vulnerable brain. And one of the most interesting things is you can start, I, I said that there's something about culture here that's important. Just as children who have learning disabilities can be cured and their perceptual processors can go from having very low capacities for memory to becoming very sophisticated and efficient, um, so too can other parts of our perceptual apparatus. We now have incredible studies um, that show that people from China and related cultures wire up their brains very differently than people from Western cultures. Um, this has nothing to do with genetics. This has to do with their experiences. But thought changes structure. And in culture, these thoughts change structure, um, you know, millions and millions of people at a time. So when you show a still life to both, for instance, Americans or um, or, or the British or Australians, and then you show them to people from Korea or China or Japan, quite unconsciously, quite involuntarily, they perceive them quite differently. And when you start testing them, you'll find that people from China are very, very good at spotting relationships between objects, including what we would consider minor relationships, and people from the, and, but they do badly on tests about the main point. 
and that people from the West have the opposite. They will find sort of the main object and be very good at it, but not great at understanding some of the relationships. And I believe these have had major impacts on, on philosophy and uh, on politics and, and, and culture. And it's one of the reasons why, um, when you're talking about issues of immigration, you have to th start thinking of immigration as, or culture shock as a form of brain shock. But we also know that over a period of time, if a person moves from one of these cultures to the other one, or one of these civilizations, really, to the other or back, their brains eventually rewire themselves. So plasticity turns out to be a very unexpected and very welcome discovery. And it'll be of use to humanity because it allows us to, in some ways, develop our brains in ways we didn't understand, and also to understand a whole number of diseases and difficulties that human beings have struggled with um, because plasticity also can give rise to great rigidities. I thank you.